much, Wendy, for all of your coordination and all of this. And so because this is a healing-centered conversation, I want to invite everyone to, unless you're listening in the car, um, and you, you're somewhere where you feel safe, you're working from home, or maybe you're in your office. Um, I just want to invite you to just take a moment to just get settled wherever you are and let your feet be firmly planted on the ground. Uh, let your back settle into the back of your chair and allow your hands to rest on your knees, either, either palms up or palms down. It's completely up to you. If you feel that you're in a place where you can close your eyes, I wanna invite you to let your top lids just gently close or fold over, as we say, your bottom lid. And I wanna invite you just to take a deep breath in through your nose and blow it out through your mouth silently. Allowing yourself to just be present in this moment, as present as possible, allowing your shoulders to relax, allowing your neck to relax, allowing yourself to get even more settled into your chair and take another deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. And when you're ready, allow your eyes to open back up, um, maybe shaking your hands out a little bit, okay? Um, just taking a moment just to center yourself. I feel like that's really important sometimes throughout the day, particularly for those of us that are doing this work, sometimes we actually forget to breathe. And so it's important to just stop throughout the day and just do a check in and just say, hey, am I breathing consciously, right? How, what is the quality of the breath? going in and out. And so I just wanted to bring that awareness in right at the top of this conversation. So again, my name is Zoe Flowers. I'm the Director of Survivor Programs with the Women of Color Network. And the mission of the Women of Color is to eliminate violence against all women and their communities by centralizing the voices, wellness, and leadership of women of color across the sovereign nations, the United States, and U.S. territories. And so for us, when we talk about women of color, we are talking about women from all and women identified folks from all racial and ethnic backgrounds that share a shared history of historic oppression, forced migration, colonization, et cetera. So we do a lot of work, again, across sovereign nations and tribal communities, et cetera. The purpose of the Women of Color Network is to work beyond and in the field of domestic violence and sexual assault to address a broad range of violence affecting communities of color, such as trafficking, police brutality, over incarceration. And we do this by examining and responding to a global context, as I said, of colonialism, imperialism, racism, sexism, transphobia, and other forms of oppression that intersect with violence against women of color and their communities. So again, quick introduction to me. I'm Zoe and I'm the Director of Survivor Programs and we're gonna talk a little bit about guidelines here and then we're gonna talk about trauma and some strategies that I use with um, my clients that I work with, whether they be healing clients um, that come to me um, or whether it's advocates and survivors working in the field of domestic violence, okay? So my gender pronouns are she, her, hers. And what motivates me to work in the field? Well, I started like so many of us as a survivor, um, although at that time, I don't think I probably um, self-identified as a survivor. I think it took me joining the work um, about 18 years ago. Um, once I joined the work, I realized, wow, there's a whole sort of movement behind what I experienced as a young woman. I had no idea about that. And so I really just joined the work because I was um, called to it, like so many of us. And I wanted to make a difference. And I wanted to ensure that no person went through the things that I went through. And so I have more than 18 years of experience working on this issue. I've appeared all across the nation, um, in the territories, uh, 
two weeks ago now, um, I was in Morocco presenting about using the arts as a way to heal from domestic and sexual violence. So that's another huge part of my work. And so the guidelines are really to respect each other and ourselves, to take responsibility for, to listen to new ideas and different ex perspectives, to speak out of your own personal experience, to value risk taking, and most importantly, just to be present in the conversation. So trauma. So trauma is a type of damage to the mind that occurs as a result of a distressing event. Trauma is often the result of an overwhelming amount of stress that exceeds the person's ability to cope or integrate the emotions involved in what that person experienced, okay? So in a way, trauma, um, our brain it works in very interesting ways to protect us from trauma. So how does trauma impact survivors? So this work, this um, set of talking points comes to us from Dr. Dianara Marte. She is a consultant with the Women of Color Network. And, um, you know, trauma takes away the ability to heal ourselves through our spiritual and innate practices. It often limits our ability to dream, to have purpose, to belong, to love, to be compassionate, to be empathetic, to tap into full self-expression of our feelings. Trauma also has us looking for answers outside of ourselves so many times. You know, we often blame ourselves for the things that happen to us um, after we experience a trauma. And so then it's, it's, it's really difficult to key back into our own internal knowing um once we've experienced trauma without some work because we do lose our ability to trust sometimes and we are often filled with guilt with shame with invisibility and isolation we don't want to talk about what happened to us we isolate ourselves so many times we think that you know this hasn't happened to anyone else it's it's only happened to us and again we're so ashamed that we often isolate ourselves and that can cause you know a really vicious circle because if you're not being around other people that are supportive if you are isolating yourself then that just gives your brain your thought process just even more time to just really um, run rampant right and do more damage we question who we are as people, you know, um, sometimes trauma can change who we are. Sometimes this work can change who we are after we've done it for a long time. We'll talk about vicarious trauma a little bit further in the conversation, right? Sometimes we lose the ability to trust and communicate with spirit and ask for what we need. Because sometimes, you know, for people who maybe have experienced religious abuse or they experienced abuse and they turned to their religious community and they were not treated in ways that were just or ways that were helpful, then that isolates them even more. And then, you know, those very things that they clung on to, um, they were separated from. And so that goes back to the very first point about taking away the ability to heal through spiritual and innate practices, because some people become very angry with whoever they call God, you know, they blame God for what happened to them as well. And so trauma can really do a number on us, right? And we often create codependent and unhealthy relationships. And we have a thousand reasons why we don't show up for our dreams. So historical trauma, uh, as used by social workers, historians, and psychologists, refers to the cumulative emotional harm of an individual or generation caused by a traumatic experience or event. 
historical trauma response refers to the manifestation of emotions and actions that stem from this perceived trauma. So at WLCN, and even for me, for the work I do outside of WLCN, I don't really talk about, you know, um, a lot of people talk about internalized oppression, and that's sort of the, the oppression that goes on within communities. So for example, I'm a member of the African American community, and so people might talk about colorism and things like that, um, where more fair skin skinned um, African Americans might be favored over darker skinned, right, um, folks. And so folks might say, oh, that's internalized oppression. But what we say is, no, that's actually an internalized oppression response. It is a response to what happened. And as a matter of fact, it's a logical response to what has happened. Okay, because by just saying it's internalized oppression, that is as if the members of that community caused it themselves when no, it is a reaction to the things that have happened. And if anyone has any questions at this point, I'm, I'm please put them in the chat and Wendy will read them out loud and I can um, delve a little bit deeper into things, okay? So vicarious trauma, so um, depending on how long folks on the call have been in the work, vicarious trauma is a phrase that's been around for a while now. Um, so it is a process that unfolds over time. It is not just your response to one person, one story, or one situation. Just like the historical trauma, it is the cumulative effect of contact with survivors of violence, disaster, or people who are struggling. So for example, a personal example. So I came to this work late 1999, early 2000. And I started my work at the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence as the office manager. And I worked there about six months and then I was promoted to the membership and training coordinator. And one of the things that I was responsible for was coordinating the 40 hour trainings for new advocates that were coming into new shelters that were members of the coalition. And we used to have this tape that we used to play called the Lisa tape. I don't know if folks on the phone are familiar with the Lisa tape, but it was an actual recording of a young girl calling 911 because her parents were fighting. And it was an extremely traumatizing thing to listen to. And we used to play it at every single 40 hour training. And we did a lot of 40 hour trainings. And it got to a certain point where I would have to walk out of the room when that recording came on. And I didn't understand why. And then after several more months on the job, I started having recurring nightmares of things that happened to me in my youth. Things that I hadn't thought of in probably 10 or 15 years. All of a sudden, I was having nightmares. And then three years into the work, I started noticing that I had a shorter and shorter temper and think I would get agitated with, you know, if I was calling the phone company and it was press one, press two, I just would feel my blood start to literally rise. I would get so angry for no reason. And then I started understanding vicarious trauma. And what was happening to me was the effect of constantly being inundated, even though I was working at the state level, even though I was not doing direct services, I was not in shelter, but just hearing the stories. And at that time, we used to get these listservs where every single morning across our computer, we would get um, stories of domestic violence every single day. There would be something in an email, a just long, a long list of all of these things that happened. And I also was in charge of the um, fatality review. And I also had to do all the clippings of all the things that were happening in Atlanta because I was living in Atlanta at the time. And I would keep all of the clippings of all the domestic violence incidences. And I became a person who was dealing with vicarious trauma because just hearing all of those stories every single day was affecting me. And it still affects me. I still have to do lots of other work um, 
to deal with the impact of doing this work. So for anyone who may be new in the work, it's not your imagination. It is, it is a logical response to what's happening to you. And again, it happens over time as you witness the cruelty, the loss, and you hear distressing stories day after day, year after year. And this is why, you know, at least at this point, it's so important to take time off of social media because social media can also be very traumatizing. And so it's very important to turn those things off, particularly for those of us that are doing the work. The most important thing out of this to me is that it is predictable. There's nothing wrong with you. It's predictable and it is ongoing. Your experience of, of vicarious trauma are continuously being influenced by your own life experience, just as I said, both those you choose and those that simply happen to you in the course of your professional and personal life. Okay. So, um, Quick resource break. So there is a phenomenal book called Trauma Stewardship by Laura Vandernoot Lipsky. Um, she was a long time, um, I think she worked at a hotline for a while, but she's a long time advocate. She's brilliant. She's a great writer. And she really talks about vicarious trauma with folks also it's a vicarious trauma is a little different than burnout but she lays all of this out in her book she has lots of cartoons in her book she has a you know she has a sense of humor so the book is also funny and so i highly recommend trauma stewardship to um anyone that might be going through um that okay so empowered based advocacy so i'm going to shift from the trauma piece and talk a little bit about advocacy and advocacy that just as it says here is empowerment based okay so general principles of advocacy are that we would hope that our advocacy is a, uh, has a certain level of accountability uh that it is non-racist and that it is accessible to everyone so i have a love-hate relationship with the term accountable um I've been looking for another word to replace it with. I haven't found one yet. I find the word to, I don't know, it just, it just, I don't know. The word just gives me the willies sometimes. Um, so I'm searching for a better word for uh, accountability. It feels very um, law enforcement-y to me. Um, it feels very um, punishment driven. So um, I'm, I'm looking for another word for myself, but it's here for now. So a quick word about empowerment. So we cannot empower anyone, okay? We don't have, I used to say, you know, we don't have an empowerment sort of magic wand where we can just tap it over someone and say, I empower you, right? So empowerment-based advocacy is based on the belief that people are already empowered, the belief that people already have everything that they need, and that oppressive systems act as roadblocks, but the individual possesses power. So a quick word about me. So I've been in the domestic violence world for 18 years. However, about, oh my goodness, maybe about 15 years or so ago, I started doing healing and wellness work as well. So when I talk about clients, I'm talking about clients that come to me to do spiritual work with them. So it can be energy work like Reiki, it can be meditation, it can be, um, different breathing exercises, all of that type of stuff. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about also from sort of the work, the healing work that I do as well, that came in and really informs the work I do with, with within the domestic violence movement as well. Okay. So the advocate's role is, the advocate's role is to be empowered and to create a place that is safe, for survivors to be empowered too. So for me, one of the things I say is that we cannot take anyone where we have not gone. And so if we do not feel empowered in ourselves, it's often very difficult for us to empower other, um, to create a place that's safe for, for survivors to be empowered as well. We might be able to give people a few references, we might be able to give people referrals and this and that, but we it's gonna be really hard for us to walk with people in true liberation if we are saddled with our own vicarious trauma, with our own historical trauma responses. If those things are unchecked, if we're working in toxic work environments, which so many of us doing this work are, uh, it's gonna be very, very hard to create a place that's safe 
for other people to thrive in, okay? Empowerment is not about informing people that we know what's best for them. It's not about assuming that we know everything about the person the first time we meet them. You know, I think that the longer that we've been doing this work, the more we are in danger of doing that. You know, we see somebody come in or maybe we hear they're from a certain um, neighborhood or we start to hear somebody's stories and we've heard a million stories. So we think we already know how that story is going to end. We don't. Okay. Every time we see a person, it should be like the first, it should be like the first time we're hearing and meeting them, okay? It's not assuming that the survivor is incapable of making decisions because they are in crisis mode, right? It's not about concentrating on people's challenges, but really helping to figure out what their strengths are and then focusing on those. And I always like to have this in here um, to say each portion of a survivor's experience, whether they stay, they leave, or they return, is logical. It's a way for them to survive, and anyone in their circumstances might do the same thing. So I'm here in Atlanta now because I've been doing training this week, um, and one of the things that one of the advocates said yesterday was she used to look down on a lot of things that um, she experienced, but now she realizes that everything she experienced brought her into the room we were in yesterday, and it and it made her a better advocate, right? And so it's just really important to remember that as we're working with people. And focusing on a holistic approach. So focusing on one issue or one problem is not enough. So that is my personal problem <laughs> that I have with trauma-informed work um, that's being touted so much around the country now. A lot of the trauma-informed responses really only focus on the trauma that brought the person in our doors. And it doesn't really look at the whole person's experience. And unless we're looking at the whole person's experience, unless we're taking historical trauma into um, account, we're not doing trauma-informed work, right? We cannot limit our work to protection orders. And the holistic approach says that the battered, the person who's being battered, whether it be a woman, whether it be a male, whether it be a gender non-conforming person, um, their needs, concerns, fears and assessment of lethality are all defined by them, right? And a holistic approach focuses on spirituality, the power of unity, wholeness, support of the family and the community, particularly when we're working with folks from underserved um, communities or marginalized communities, we wanna be able to lift this up as much as we can. So I also like to bring in the human rights approach when thinking about doing our work with survivors. So the human rights approach really goes beyond acquiring cultural knowledge to serve people. Um, when I first started doing this work, we would say, you know, make sure you have certain magazines that reflect people, make sure you have shampoo for everybody. And those things are still really, really important, but we can't just rely on those things and think that we're serving everyone. Okay, individual and institutional commitments towards creating multicultural institutions committed to social change and the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, that's a lot of words, right? But, and so I will distill all that down to say, check out the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is an amazing document and it can really be used to guide the work we do in our programs and with the people that we serve, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, okay? And really working towards creating social change is really, really important. And the Universal De Declaration of Human Rights can kind of guide us in ways to doing that. So the human rights approach also says the inherent dignity, equal and unalienable rights of all members of the human family without distinction. So the human rights approach really lifts that up. The human rights approach really says we are inherently, we inherently are equal. We all have rights without any distinction. Okay. And so with that being said, then it only makes sense that a one size fits all approach is inadequate to the experiences and the needs of diverse groups of people who are abused. Because again, 
we need to be looking at the whole person. So Soul Requirements is my company. Um, and I do a lot of work about becoming magical. And really, and for me, that means taking situations that could be harmful and reframing them and reimagining them and using them and transforming them into something beautiful, into something that can be used. And so I love this, please do not fear, feed the fears, right? Um, because one of the things I like to say is whatever is happening to us is a perfect reflection. It's a perfect reflection. What is your reflection showing you? So if I'm having uh, difficult conversations with people, if I'm having difficult um, relationships, I look at that as a reflection, a perfect reflection. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get into the resiliency conversation and how I sort of came to this mindset. So before I hop into resilience, I wanna just, again, we've covered a lot of information already. Um, so I wanna just take a breather and see if anyone has any questions or any comments that they want to add. So far, nothing's in the chat box. So if y'all have any questions, any comments, suggestions, please chat them in. We're interested. We all are interested. Thanks. So um, if folks want to put in the chat what they think of when they hear the word resilience, and I will tell you a little bit about the definition of resilience. So there are these next couple of slides are going to require you to, you know, offer a little bit of information. So I really do invite you to participate and put your answers in the chat. Um, so the definition of capacity is, is of resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties and toughness. So I just did a resiliency uh, workshop yesterday with a colleague of mine here in Atlanta. And um, one of the things that she says in her part of the conversation is that resilience is accessible to everyone. It was once thought that only certain people were resilient, but now we know that everyone is born with the capacity to be resilient, okay? And so for me, when I think about resilience, I look at what, some of the research says from the leading psychologists like Susan Kubasa, and she really points to three elements that are essential to resilience. And so one is that resilient people view a difficulty as a challenge, not a paralyzing event. Now that's really difficult, right, with the folks that we're working with, because we know that when you've experienced so many, so much abuse, um, that really can feel paralyzing. You know, so, but a resilient person looks at their quote unquote failures and mistakes as lessons to be learned from and as opportunities for growth. They don't view them as a negative reflection on their abilities or their self-worth. So that kind of goes into what I was saying about a reflection. I look at difficulties and things like that now as teaching moments and teaching experiences. And I really ask myself, no matter what the case is, you know, what could I, what could I have learned? from this situation? What could I have maybe done differently, right? And then she also talks about commitment. And she says, resilient people are committed to their lives and their goals, and they have a compelling reason to get out of the bed in the morning, right? Commitment isn't just restricted to their work. They commit to their relationships, their friendships, the causes they care about, and their religious and spiritual beliefs, right? And that is the same for me. So full disclosure, I do these webinars. I talk about healing for advocates and with survivors, but for me, my goal is to help anybody who's hearing this to be more resilient in your life. I don't just engage in these conversations so that people can be more effective at work, okay? Because to me, yes, work is important. However, to me as a healer, it's more important to me that you are figuring out how to have the life that you want, that you're experiencing the freedom you want in your life. Okay, and then comes work or whatever. But for me, the primary goal of this conversation is not to help you be a better worker. It's to help you feel freer in your body and in your life, okay? 
Also, battery card set, yeah. can I just... Yeah, we got tons of stuff in the chat. Yeah, let me hear them. Yes. Some of the stuff from the chat says empowerment of self. Yes. I found this comment to be interesting. It's just my take on it. Can be mimicked by fear mm. going forward, regardless of the projected outcome, even if the odds are against you. Yes. The ability to recover and adapt. And um, I think there was one more strong and brave, able to yes. overcome. Amazing. And I would love for um, Carolyn, if you could just say a little bit more, because I'm very curious about how it can be mimicked by fear. So if you feel comfortable putting that in the chat, I invite you to do that. Um, so the last thing that Dr. Kabasa says about resilient people is that they spend their time and energy focusing on situations and events that they have control over. So one of the things I talked about yesterday is that I, I really try to focus on things in segments um, and things that I can actually control. And I, you know, I, I try to live like moment by moment, day by day. Um, of course, sometimes I travel into the future and planning and all of that, but I really try to reel myself back and really just focus on things I can control in the moment, like my thoughts, because that's really all I can control is my thoughts and the way I see things and the way I react to things, right? And so those are the things I really try to focus on. And then um, one of the other key points, so on this issue of thoughts, one of the other things that psychologists talk about is the way we talk about ourselves, the way we explain setbacks to ourselves is also important to resilience. And this really is the crux of the healing work that I do with people is helping people reframe their beliefs. Okay. And I'm going to talk about that more. So I love this quote about um, from Dr. Maya Angelou, who says, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but we rarely admit the changes it's gone through to achieve that beauty. So sometimes, you know, we don't always lift up the struggles and the hard times that brought us out on the other side. Sometimes we want to just speed right through to the other side instead of really, like I said, stopping and saying, what is this situation teaching me? What is this frustration teaching me? What is this anger teaching me? What is this rage that I have inside of me? What are those things teaching me? And how can I take that into my life? And how can I take that to the people that I work with, the survivors that I work with, the victims that I work with, okay? So what resilience looks like on the individual level? So we talked about resilience, not letting, um, not uh, keeping us stuck, right? Um, people who are optimistic are typically, typically have more resilience. They see bad events as not as temporary, not permanent, again, which can be challenging, especially if you've had, you know, a lot of abuse over the lifespan, you really might think this is how your life is going to be forever. Um, but resilient people understand that these things are just temporary, right? Um, you know, churchy folks say, uh, what is it? Uh, pain doesn't last always, all this too shall pass, things like that. Um, keeping those things in mind can help you to be uh, more resilient. They don't let bad events and setbacks affect other areas of their lives, right? So it's like, okay, I might be really bad at relationships, but guess what? I'm really great at math, right? So we don't put a blanket over our whole entire life and um, just say we're horrible at ev everything, right? We just look at that one event. And then people who are resilient don't blame themselves when bad things occur. They sort of, you know, look at other reasons why, right? They don't beat themselves up all the time. So I would love for you all to put in the chat what makes you all resilient. What empowers you? What makes you bounce back? Okay. What are some of the traits that you carry? And then how do you help people who have been harmed to see their strengths? Sometimes it's easier for us to answer this question <laughs> Then this question, right? So Amy says, when I think of resilience, I think of the empowerment of self. Absolutely. Absolutely.
-hmm. Thank you. Keep putting them in. And how do you help people who have been harmed to see their strengths as well? Please put those in the chat as well. And we're going to keep going. So this is all about finding other ways to tell our stories and our histories again, because for me, it's all about reframing our stories. So when I am working with people and people come to my house or they come to a retreat that I'm holding, one of the things that um, I ask them is what happened to you and we have a whole you know, particularly on retreat, we have a whole exercise where folks can talk about what happened to them. And then for me, the most important part of this conversation is what do you believe about yourself as a result of what happened to you? Because see, that's where we get stuck. The stories that we create and the stories that we tell ourselves because of what happened to us. And again, for those of us that are helpers, for those of us that do social justice work, I feel like we're so good at helping other folks to work through this, but it's so challenging for us to gift it to ourselves. We can sit with survivors and help them reframe their stories all day long, but when it comes to us, sometimes we can be our own worst critic, right? So really getting to what do you believe about yourself as a result of what happened to you? And then what do you need to heal? And then you can ask either the people you're working with or you can, so this is a, what I call a parallel conversation. So it can be for you as the listener or you can use it in your work. Right. So asking a survivor, what are the recurring patterns in your life that move you forward or backwards in your work or in your life? Right. Because for me, it's not good or bad. You know, sometimes survivors or even us, we might say, oh, I made a bad decision. Oh, I did this bad. I'm a bad person. Right. And again, some of those things are left over that's residue from things that we heard as children or their messages that we got, particularly if we come from certain communities and things like that, we have this thing where we think we're bad. So then we make bad decisions. For me, I believe that there are things that move us forward, there, there are things that move us back, and there are things that keep us stuck. So what I'm curious about is what are those recurring patterns that might be keeping you stuck? And then is there a part of life that you're ignoring, right? I had to make space to do my healing work. I had to make space to be an artist because for the first, oh my goodness, I would say 10 years of doing this work, I completely ignored my artistic side. A hundred percent, I ignored my creativity. I put it on the back burner until I couldn't put it on the back burner anymore. Right. And so we have to also figure out what are those parts that make me feel alive that I might be ignoring? And then what goals have you accomplished? Because it, it, another great way to build resilience and to reframe your story is to look at what you've done really well. So, yeah, you might not have published that book that you wanted to do. But what are the other things that you've accomplished, right? And how can you use your experience accomplishing those things to feed the other part of you that you wanna feed? And then what goals would you like to accomplish, okay? And do you have a clear picture of who you wanna be as an advocate or as a person or as a writer, or as a creative person, whoever? Do you have a clear picture of that? I, do, I also do a lot of visualization. I do a ton of journaling. And so writing things down is really amazing. I used to do lots of um, vision boards. I used to have people at my house and we would do vision parties and um, all those vision board parties and things like that. And I would write down what I wanted my uh, life to look like. And a lot of those things have happened. A lot of those things that I put on those vision boards have happened. And then the other question is, how can you show up fully in your personal, spiritual, and professional life? Again, vision boards can be really, really amazing for this. You can have a vision board. And for those of you that might not know what a vision board is, you can Google it. There's all types of videos now. Back in the day when I started doing vision and boards, it was like <laughs> early 2000s. A lot of this stuff was thought of to be woo-woo, but now you can Google vision boards and, and it'll come up. But um, you can do a vision boards 
just for your personal life. You can do a vision board for your spiritual life. You can do a vision board for your professional life, or you can do a big vision board and just have, you know, those things all in one. You can put time limits on things, especially, you know, if journaling is your thing, you could write out your dreams. What do you want your life to look like in six months? What do you want your life to look like by next year, right? We're in the midpoint of the year, right? It's about to be 2020. So, you know, what do you want to accomplish for the next six months? How can you start setting yourself up now to go into 2020 the way you want to? How, how can you bring that work into your work with survivors? How can you help them to plan for, you know, stepping into 2020, right? You can write all of those things out. For people who are visual, again, that vision board, cutting out photos of the life you want to live, maybe doing that work with survivors could be really helpful. And then I would recommend reading that reading that journal entry over and over again, looking at that vision board every day, 18 seconds a day, um, and really start to, what we say is act as if it has already happened, right? Creative dreaming, tricking the brain. I do a lot of that in my work with people, okay? Transition rituals. So Jamia, you put this in here perfectly. So this is exactly what I'm talking about. Journaling after a hard day is a great relief and it helps me break the habit of cycling negative scenarios and thoughts. Thank you for that because that is what a transition ritual is. A transition ritual is something that you do for, that takes you from one state of mind to another state of mind. So example, for me, at one point I went through a particularly bad breakup. So what I did was lemongrass is an essential oil that's very helpful. It's a mood enhancer. It's good for depression, right? There's um, sweet orange, which is good for energy, good for clarity. Uh, before bed, you could use an essential oil like peppermint or lavender. Those things are really good for relaxation. So you want to create a different state. You want to do journaling after a hard day. That's a transition ritual. So if I, I luckily I work from home now, but when I did used to work in an office, and I live in New York City where it's crazy, right? So I would come home from like being on the subway and all of those things. First thing I would do, I would light some lemongrass and burn it. That was my transition ritual. Turn off my cell phone. I'm no longer in work mode. I'm at home, you know, and now I'm in a new state of mind. And then before bed, I might take some lavender or I might take some um, peppermint oil and I might rub that on my feet before I go to bed. And that's my transition to going to bed or I might journal and that's my transition, right? Connecting with nature obviously is so important. Creative expression is a lifesaver. Finding some sort of spiritual practice could be meditation. Um, meditation is hard for some people. Some people have a hard time quieting the mind. So for people that have a hard time quieting the mind, I would suggest guided meditations because that gives your brain something to do. Um, doing things that increase self-awareness. So self-awareness could be, if you're driving, becoming aware of your hands on the steering wheel. What do your hands on the steering wheel feel like? What does it feel like as your foot presses down into the brake? So many of us are dissociated. So many of us are out of our bodies. So these are things that I do to intentionally keep me in my body and keep me aware, right? Going into a grocery store, taking notice of how I feel, right? Before I worked at home, I would start to notice that I'd feel great. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd do my meditation, I'd feel amazing. And then I'd go to work and all of a sudden I would be feeling horrible while I was in the office. And then I would leave the office and I would feel great again. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, I had to have that level of self-awareness. So then it was like, oh, okay. So you're having a reaction to being in the office. <laughs> and so you have to do a little bit of something different right? If I wasn't aware, I probably would have just ignored it. So Tara says my transitional ritual is changing from my work clothes to changing into my comfy at home clothes as soon as I get home. That is so funny. So I have a very good friend of mine. And every time she comes over, 
she has a change of clothes. Like she has Zoe apartment clothes. <laughs> so she could have on work clothes and she'll just dig into her little bag and she'll have like these baggy clothes and just so she can be comfy on my couch and drink tea. And that's probably her transition ritual. I think I'm just realizing that right now. So yes, and obviously humor, humor is important. So what um, resilience can look like at the organizational level? So these are things that you can really think of. And again, you're gonna get this PowerPoint. And this is really important for those of you that are in management, for those of you that aren't in management, maybe this is something you can bring up at staff meetings, really start to think about what you can employ to build resilience with the populations you work with and also at work, because sometimes our workplace can be traumatic, right? What structures need to be in place to support you in your efforts to build resilience with the populations you're working with, right? So this is also something I would love for you all to capture this. Um, and again, start to think about what structures need to be in place and maybe bring this up at a staff meeting if you can. Um, maybe we could do part two, Wendy, of this conversation um, where we can talk about what folks need. And that then- That's totally um, fine with me. You Just said it's fine with you? Yeah. Uh, I'm loving this and I want to know what my advocates want. So let me know and we can do part two of this. Yeah, if folks want to delve deeper, um, again, you're going to get the PowerPoint. Hopefully you'll get the recording as well. And, you know, maybe some of you will employ some of the tips and tricks that I've shared. And maybe we could do something in three months or maybe we could do something in six months and see where y'all are at. And we could do like a little, you know, check in um, because I've mentioned the essential oils. I've mentioned the vision board. You all will have my contact information. So you can feel free to reach out to me personally and ask me for other tips. But I think we should definitely do a part two. <laughs> and so for me. <laughs> okay, great. And so um, we just have to remember no matter how mature we become, we're still babies in this world. And so this is something that one of my teachers um, told me about two or three years ago. Um, he said, you know, you're still a baby in the universe. And so, you know, going back to being like a child, for me, curiosity is so important. It's such an important part of my healing. And I like to impart that in my healing work um, to just try to be back like babies. So uh, let's see, my contact information should be right there. Yep, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to leave room for a couple questions. I also want to let you know how you can find me on social media. Um, so um, if you want to find me on Instagram, you can find me at I am Zoe Flowers. If you want to find me on Facebook, you can find me at I am Zoe Flowers. Um, I also wrote a book called From Ashes to Angels, Dust a Journey Through Womanhood. And that book is actually um, interviews that I did with women of color about their experiences with domestic and sexual violence of all ages from all backgrounds. And so um, all of the, the stories are interview style. There were some that folks mailed in. So a couple of them are narrative, but most of them are interview style. And there's also healing techniques in the book that folks can use with survivors. From Ashes to Angels Dust, A Journey Through Womanhood. If you just type in Zoe Flowers Domestic Violence, it'll all come up, but it's available on Amazon. And there's healing techniques. There's um, spiritual baths that you can take. That's in the book. There's places where you can journal in the book. There's also um, different uh, the societal reasons for violence, the pop culture reasons for violence, racial and ethnic reasons for violence, and in the back of the book, it's all domestic violence hotlines all across the country. So, um, and there's also safety planning information in there, and, and my poetry is in there too, so there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, yeah, so just type in Zoe Flowers Domestic Violence and you'll find me, and um, you can also email me at zflowers at Inc. Dot org. And Wendy, I want to thank you for um, inviting me to have this uh, part one of this healing conversation. You are so welcome. I feel so honored that you agreed to do this. I mean, the 
I don't know. I think you're seeing the chat where it says you are an awesome all caps presenter and healer. And Thank where you. quite a few people said yes, they want a part two. So Great. Zoe, we will I will be in touch about part two and we will talk about that and when that will be best to do it. And I'm thinking maybe right before the holidays when people start getting stressed out. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said that because so the other thing WOCN does is we just started, so we created this great healing and wellness platform. Thank you so much for reminding me. So we have a podcast called Radical Self Care with Becky and Zoe. And so we just had a podcast on Tuesday, our summertime podcast. So we're doing things seasonally to get folks into the habit of working with the seasons. And um, so, if you go to WOC, if you go to um, our Facebook page, Women of Color um, Inc. on Facebook, you'll see the YouTube video of that conversation. So we had a phenomenal conversation with Diana Marte about the spring. We had a great conversation on Tuesday with Yolanda Porso about she was a substance abuse person and a survivor, and now she's a meditation guru, and so she talks about that. And, and self care things that won't break your pocketbook. So yes, please um, also go to our podcast and follow that. And we have a healing and wellness survey, which I think Wendy sent out to folks. So we're doing a lot of stuff around healing at WOCN. And I am just thrilled that you are. And I am so grateful for the generosity, not just of you and your organization. And I cannot begin to thank you enough. Thank you so much. No, thank you. So um, any more questions, chat them in. I'll be hanging out for a few minutes. Joe, I know you need to get off to go to another. Yes, a two o'clock webinar. Back to that. <laughs> um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So please, um, you know, if we're going to do this, chat it in right now. And um, we're we're good okay, okay so thank you so very much thank you i'll be in touch to set up the next training okay great and, and um i'll talk to you in a bit thank you okay. so thank you